today uh, we have a presentation on the <coughs> film. It's a funny film. So I thought, uh, well, I talked a lot about uh, this film and the language, and I bored, you, I bored you a lot. In, I bored myself as well, so it's okay. So I thought that we should talk about something fun and talk about it and interact. And maybe some of you, you know, have an idea about it. So. When I'm talking, you know, feel free to uh, comment or interrupt me anytime. So we'll start first with the presentation. <coughs> and uh, I try to. I try to cover any of the points that I remember, so I'm sure I forgot all the points, but these are the ones I thought. Uh, the most important thing, or the most maybe different, you know. So uh, first of all, I want to start with the <coughs> picture here. You know, uh, it's a photo of a horse, a Arabian horse with the pyramids in the back. So uh, there are three animals in uh, Arabian culture that we are very proud of: the horse, and the falcon, and the camel, of course. And some people praise also wolves, you know, so. But uh, the Arabian horse and the, the camels are, you know, originally from the peninsula. And uh, they are like a source of pride. And there are a lot of poems about camels and horses and less about falcons, but there are some about falcons. And falcons are really expensive. So falcon, you know, price is maybe more than, you know, like a big house in Ashton. Yeah, it's expensive. <laughs> it's a sport of the rich people. So, so one of the let's go first. Oh my God! So uh, this is one of the biggest difference the differences in the Middle East is like holding hands. And this photo I think was about ten years ago when King of <coughs> was uh, crown prince, and uh, it was published in the media. And uh, for us, it was nothing new. You know? Then I heard like from an American uh, friend, journalist, he said, what do you think about this? Yeah, nothing else, okay. Why? Because uh, for us, holding hands is not a uh, big issue. It's like friendship, you know? So at that time, I didn't know that it's something no no in the West, so. So holding hands, you know, between guys is common and uh, doesn't have any like sexuality involved in it. It's a sign of friendship. And I remember like I had a Australian friend and she was telling me, she was preparing to come to work in Saudi Arabia as a nurse and uh, she got some guidelines from the Saudi embassy and they sent her some papers and she said like, I got the impression it's a very conservative ca country. Then she said the first thing she noticed when she landed in the airport in Riyadh is uh, like all the men are holding hands. Then she said, am I, am I in the right place? Or <laughs> <laughs> but it's a true story. You know? Another thing is also uh, maybe more bizarre, more bizarre than just holding hands is men's you know kiss in the cheek. So this is something you know traditional and also doesn't have any sexual meaning, you know, and. Uh, in some regions, also they touch with the nose, you know. So from far away, it looks like they're kissing, but actually they're just touching the nose. So that's also uh, something cultural, and uh, you don't have to do it if you go to the Middle East. You can tell, you can tell them I don't kiss men, you know, or something. Or <laughs> usually, <laughs> usually people, you know, don't um, try to do it with uh, foreigners, you know, because they understand there are differences. But uh, some people, like <coughs> some uh, international friends I met there, they got used to it and, and it's okay with it. So um, another thing is also you have to avoid to certain names to say in Arabic, you know? So for example, any name that contains another you know, combination of like N-I-C or N-I-K, like in the end or the beginning, try to not say it, you know, because it's, it could mean something offensive in Arabic. So uh, you should use uh, like your last name to introduce yourself, or uh, I don't know, make up, make up a nickname. <laughs> so, <laughs> I 
remember there was a French guy, uh, I, was, I used to work in a, in a bank, and there was a French guy, and his name is uh, Yannick. And this, this is the worst. Yeah? <laughs> so did you guys know what I'm talking about? So, uh, and he used to introduce <laughs> yeah, well, with, uh, the yeah. He used to introduce with himself with the, the first name. <coughs> Somebody, I think, took him to the side and said, you should maybe not do that, you know? <laughs> but, but then they read his uh, name in the card, in the business card, and it's the same problem, so. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it means something, uh, I don't know how to say it in a uh, polite word. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe no love can. <laughs> 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 We're all in the dirty it's word. Easy. Therefore, okay? Oh. Okay, so I cannot explain that. <laughs> and with every name, it's uh, different, you know, but it's all, you know, the same role. You guys sell Nikes? Yes. Yeah, Nikes. But we, we changed the name to <laughs> Renata. Okay. Renata. Renata? Renata? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it's, it's the same role, you know, with Nike. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, it's a little bit offensive, so yeah. okay. they changed the name to Granada. Personal. Say it again, please. What? What does it mean? What, what it says the F word in English. Oh. Uh, yeah. The F word? Oh, uh -huh. uh -huh. yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's, I don't want to go to details about it. <laughs> right. but, you know what I mean. Another name to avoid uh, also, I mean, I, I'm not trying to be offensive, you know, I'm uh, respectful and I like these names, but if your name is Paul and you are in an uh, Arab country, you may have to think, you know, twice before saying your name. Because it may sound, it's less, it's not offensive, but it will sound funny. So, maybe you should think of a different name or, like, use your last name. With the, and it depends, like with people who are more like exposed to Western culture, they will not find it you know, like, you know, as funny as people who never heard it before. So, I will leave that up to you to discover. You should use these names when you go to any Arab country. My name is Nick Paul. <laughs> <laughs> and the other names, I mean, they're not offensive, but they will sound funny if you say them, like Wayne. We talking about that. It means where, or where I am. So, for Anna, it means uh, myself or I am. And, and I heard the name Thora in English. Well, like, Thora, like a name of a girl, and it's it doesn't sound good in Arabic because it mean it may mean bull, bull, or it may mean uh, revolution. And the uh, revolution for I think many people are not. It's not you know good, you know good thing. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> and the name Mia, Mia is uh, some some Arab uh, girls you know, use it as well, but it means 100. So uh -huh. it may sound funny, you know. If you have a daughter called Mia, you know, or something, you introduce her to your Arab friend, and they may laugh, you know. But it's not offensive. <laughs> <laughs> so these are some. Uh, good. And avoid saying the word kiss. It also has a bad meaning in Arabic. So the Arabic word for it is uh, bosa, which is close to the Spanish peso. So you can use it. You can use this, you know, if you want to talk about this subject, you know. And I'm sure in your first uh, maybe three meetings with your Arab friends, you're not mentioned kissing. So okay. you, you don't have to say it. You know? <laughs> but it could mean something really offensive. I cannot say it. So, so the both maybe no, no off, you know, could help you after class. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not around. I'm not around. I'm not around. So, yeah, these are some funny things. And uh, another other things that are important in Arabic culture, like very different from the here, is you don't call senior people with their first name. Never. Even if they tell you. Try to call them like uh, the most common thing is to add, uh, like uh, to ask them what's your like the oldest son or daughter. Then you add uh, Abu, which means father of, or Om. Um. So this is the most you know respectful way. So if I was uh, maybe 65 years old and my my son's name is. Let's say 
Powder, my no. So you would so you would call me Abu Ada, for example, or my son name is Muhammad Abu Muhammad, and my wife, you know, Um Muhammad. So or like another respectful way is like to say Haji or Hajiya, like Haji for a guy and Hajiya for a, a woman, and that's if you don't know the name. And you do is more respectful. And uh, I'm 76, and you can call me Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and if they introduce themselves with the doctor, like for example, and we use the Arabic name, you know? so the first name I mean, so Dr. Aisha, or like in the <coughs> you have to call them by that title, because they, it depends on the person, but sometimes they feel offended, you know, if you don't, if they tell you like the first time my name is Dr. Faisal, and you don't call me Dr. Faisal, then they feel offended. So titles are important, and uh, you should you should ask them. You know what should I maybe call you? you know? And uh, yeah, the most common thing I, <coughs> I was saying you know to use Abu or Om. Uh, this is the safest you know thing to do, unless they are like the difference is not really huge. Then you can call of course by the first name, or you can say Habibi. Habibi means you know literally means my love. But it could mean like my friend, my dear one, something like that. So it's not you know exclusive for your spouse or you know, something. Like that. So you could you could use it. It's a friendly way of saying saying like my friend. And the one thing also is like uh, the right hand you know is important in our culture. It's like if you use your left hand, it's, nobody will kill you or anything. But you know it's like some people may find it offensive. So. To be on the safe side, you know, use your right hand for everything good you do, like handing a paper, drinking, eating, waving. And uh, for example, uh, yeah, like uh, one of the most like maybe common mistakes is like when somebody gives you a, a cup of coffee and you receive it to the left. This is like, no, no. <laughs> so it depends, of course, but. Uh, you know, it's, it's better not to use the left hand, you know. And I thought, like, some, you know, common words that are, you know, good to use, you know, like, like the word Habibi, you know. You can use it in, with anyone, you know, how, no matter how old they are. I mean, if they are, like, senior people, then you, should, you shouldn't, you know, use it, you know, unless they tell you they like it. And of course, you know, the greeting, you know, Salaam Alaikum. And Shukran for saying thank you. And, uh, you know, uh, when we talk, you know, we sound like we are angry, you know? If, if anybody, you know, have been to Italy or like Mexico, you know, you get the picture, you know? But uh, most of the time, you know, we're, this is the way we talk, you know, we talk with uh, loud, you know, we use our hands a lot. We shout when we talk, you know, but it doesn't mean angry, so it might be a little bit difficult, you know, for you to, to know if they're angry or not. But I think after spending, you know, some time, you'll, you'll get used to it. You'll know by the, you know, by the face or by the tone they're talking, you know, if they're angry or not. So uh, if you think they're, they're mad or something, you know, you should, you should say Salah al Nabi or Red for Allah. These are two words, you know, the good, you know, tension diffuser, you know. And uh, if they're not uh, mad, then they, they will laugh, you know, because they don't expect you to say it. And for us, it's like very common. Like if I see Nawab is mad at Muhammad, you know, I'll say Salah, then you know they will come down. So it's something cultural. I cannot really explain you know, why these were, you know words work, but they work, you know, every time. Sorry, I took it off, maybe. So I, I have this uh, in my computer, so if anyone wants it, I can email it to you. And I think uh, I completed like 10 words, but I think uh, I forgot you know, to save it. So I'll make sure to correct this error and uh, send it to you if you want. So these are some of the little things that I was thinking about, and they are a little bit different than my experience. Hopefully you all you know visit the Middle East soon and you have a
or a good word for us to visit there or something. So these are how to, to use you know, as a starter, you know. Then as you learn Arabic or immerse yourself in the culture, you will find your own favorite words. So I'm sorry, you know, I forgot to, to add the other half, but uh, I promise I will. Any questions? Go ahead. Well, you can use the left hand like with sports or, or like you know, writing or something, but just don't use it, for example, with eating or, or drinking. You know. So parents will try to encourage their kids you know, to use it for eating and drinking. And if they can't, like, if they can't, like, uh, it's too difficult, then it's, it's an exception, you know. Any other questions, comments? What is Okay, well, uh, we'll start with uh, another uh, something you know, about culture, a movie, like a short uh, video. It was made by um, a guy called uh, Ali Katimi, and I've known him for a few years. And uh, some of the people that he cooperated to work you know, with in the video, I know, like, uh, there is an American guy in the video, and he's from Houston, Texas, and his name is Todd Mims. And he lived there for a long time, and, and uh, another guy called Tommy Lopez. So in this video, they explain like a culture shock, you know, from the point of view of an American guy who was visiting Saudi Arabia. So uh, there are some things you know are, are difficult to understand, maybe for you. So uh, I don't know. You tell me what you think about it. And uh, I have to explain some things, you know, for you in the beginning. So like for example, um, one of the things uh, so they talk about Saudi Arabia, and one of the things are common between uh, first of all, you know, Saudi Arabia has one of the highest you know uh, like growth rates in the world, and uh, most of like seventy percent are under thirty. So we have a huge population that are young, you know, and if you don't keep them busy, you know, they will get in trouble, you know. So that's. Uh, but so the government, you know, should focus on, you know. So uh, one common thing we do is not good, you know, but it's really common, is uh, car drifting. So it's really dangerous, I don't recommend it. I myself did it, you know, when I was younger. I think it's a life cycle of every Saudi. You know? So uh, it could be dangerous, you know, I heard some horror stories, I saw some accidents, you know, some people died and some people got injured and I don't personally recommend it, but it's something really common. You know, when you have, you know, the gas price is nine cents per liter, and you have zero taxes you know, on uh, importing cars, and you have uh, big roads and you know a lot of you know young population, then you know, expect trouble. You know, <laughs> so <laughs> so yeah, these are some things that are common. And for example, like uh, dune bashing and all the sports, you know. Know, can, related to cars are you know really common, and people do them with their own cars. So they adjust their cars, and you know they do it for racing or doing bashing or other things. And uh, another thing also is uh, maybe more you know obvious in Saudi Arabia is like the segregation between women and men. So it's, you can have some places where there is a mix. Know, like hospitals and some universities and some other places, but but usually, you know, the most common thing is like uh, there is a segregation, and uh, it's less in other Arab countries, you know. But uh, if you find a segregated place in a village, for example, in Egypt, you know, then that's you know something you know usual. You know. It's not surprising for me, you know, but maybe for people from different cultures, it's a little bit surprising. So it depends where you go, and even in Saudi Arabia, you know, you can have mixed places. So these are the other things that they want to explain. But uh, I don't think I'm not uh, familiar with other things. And uh, so the segregation also goes in the dancing. You know, so some American friends saw the video for us. Why, like, Saudi men don't dance with women? It's if they are not your family, you know, usually you don't dance with them, you know. 
because uh, you don't want to offend them or you don't want to offend your friend. You know? So if I dance with uh, the sister of uh, Catherine, you know, she may feel offended, you know, or something like that. I mean, another culture. <laughs> Like that. So it's something cultural. It's really difficult to explain in five minutes, you know. And unless you visit, you know, like Arab countries and live there, maybe. <laughs> okay. um, we're going to start off with the uh, continuation of a little bit where we left off before with the revelations and words coming to the Prophet Muhammad uh, during the period of the uh, the receiving the recitation. Uh, the voice of the, of the angel Gabriel. Uh, and something becomes very apparent here. I think in the Islamic tradition that there is there is no there's no real discontinuity between what is going on with the Prophet Muhammad and is receiving the message through the angel Gabriel. Uh, because Gabriel is a is a key player also, in the New Testament, it's the angel Gabriel that announces to both Mary and Joseph of the birth of Jesus. It's the angel Gabriel. So that connection is there. Angel Gabriel has uh, also uh, fundamental parts in the Old Testament. So there's a lot of, there's, there, there is this, there this built-in continuity that God is using the same messenger throughout. Uh, this revelatory period, both in, before uh, the Prophet Muhammad and then during his lifetime, uh, he is the last of the revelation of God. But there is this consist there is this consistent theme. I mean, it may not be pre preached as a theme, but there, but there's a, there's a consistent and obvious connections to the other two uh, monotheistic religions, which are also revealed religion. <coughs> So you, you sort of have to, I mean, whether you believe in any of this or not, that's not the issue. The issue is what you need to see is the connective issue. <coughs> okay. Uh, you have his preaching talking about strict monotheism. God is one. God is great. Repudiation of polytheism. Uh, and the pronounce, pronouncement of heaven and hell. Those who accept the words of the prophet, heaven, those who do not, hell. Not again, not in light, Judaism and Christianity in many ways. But in the years, uh, things began to change from, not in terms of what he's receiving, but things begin to change in terms of how this is, message is being received on the, on the Arabian Peninsula, in the city of Mecca, especially something that's brewing, because there are a number of people that are beginning to follow Muhammad. They're not the powerful, they're not the mighty, they're not the wealthy. They are people, however, who are have already beginning to reject polytheism. And the name of these people, they're called Hanifs, H-A-N-I-F. Hanif is one who is moving away from polytheism and he's He's moving toward a belief in one God. And you begin to see that that is developing already. And many of these people are those who come to follow uh, the Prophet Muhammad. Also, you have developing here a, a, a sense that the, the citizens of Mecca, particularly here the, the wealthy, the powerful, are not accepting this message. Uh, and there is a looming sort of upcoming persecution. It's going to start happening. And just before that happens, in the year 620 of the, of the Christian era, using, still using the Christian calendar here, in the year 620, uh, Muhammad has this, the Prophet Muhammad has this, this uh, nocturnal vision, nocturnal journey nighttime journey from one city to a lesser city, the other city, uh, he's going to have a vision of the city of Jerusalem. 
Now, this is a, it's, is it a dream sequence? Is it something surreal? Is it, is it a, a real event? It's a nocturnal journey, and that's all we're going to see. But, but something is real about it. And he talks about Jerusalem as being the third, later it's going to become the third holiest city in Islam because of historic connections between uh, the past of the Arab people and the city of Jerusalem. It's, just not, it's not just a city of the Jews. It's also a city of the Arabs. Okay, this is holy ground. And it's, it's on that basis after this nocturnal journey and the, and, and the and I'd say the impact that that has on him, with that that spiritual, <coughs> I would say like a spiritual impact in his life, whatever happened is real to him. Okay, it's real. It's real to him, <coughs> and it's prep. I see it as preparation for what happens, and that is the beginning of persecution. Persecution starts right after this. Right after the journey. And, but he's fortified by this. He's fortified by the fact that, that uh, God has revealed this, these things to him. It's a supernatural revelation. If you look in the Holy Quran, you look in, in the Shura or chapter 17, that's where the Isra is mentioned. I-S, it's I-S-R-A, Isra, chapter 17 of the Quran. If you have an English translation, it doesn't matter. English translation. You can see it, read about it. And in that, in, in that chapter, there is a breakdown here of a number of commandments that are all, almost identical to the commandments that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not lie. Uh, there's a number of things that I mean, very parallel. I brought a copy of the, of the Holy Quran today. I, I'll just take a look at some of these things that show up here. So this is, this is a vision, and this is also a speech or a, a bit of a dictation given to him that coincides very closely with what God said to Moses. Lord knows best what is in your hearts. He knows if you are good. He will surely forgive those that turn to him. Give to the near of kin their due, and also to the destitute and to the traveler in need. It's, that's called hospitality. Do not squander your substance wastefully, for the wasteful are Satan's brothers, and Satan is ever ungrateful to his Lord. But if while waiting for your Lord's bounty, you lack the means to assist them, then at least speak to them kindly. Okay. Be neither miserly nor prodigal, for then you should either earn reproach or be reduced to penury. Your Lord gives abundantly to whom he will and sparingly to whom he pleases. He knows and observes his servants. You shall not kill your children for fear of want. We will provide them for them and for you. This is going to become very basic <coughs> in almsgiving in the Quran. Very basic. One of the five pillars. You shall not commit adultery, for it is lewd and evil. You shall not kill any man whom God has forbidden you to kill, except for a just cause. If a man is slain unjustly, his heir shall be entitled to satisfaction. Let him not carry his vengeance to access, for his victim is sure to be assisted and avenged. Uh, this is sort of the law of the blood avenger. It comes out of earlier tribal law, but it's repeated here in uh, the Shura. Do not approach the property of orphans, except with the best of motives until they reach maturity. Keep your promises. Give full measure when you, when you measure and weigh with even scales. In other words, don't cheat. Do not follow what you do not know. Man's <coughs> eyes, ears, and heart, each of his senses shall be closely questioned. Do not walk proudly on the earth. You cannot split the earth, nor can you rival the mountains in stature. 
it's a little it's a little lesson in humility here. This root, think about how big we really are. Not too big. Okay. Now, uh, with that happening, and I think with the prophet's assurance that God again assures that he's with him, that he's given the, what the message that he's getting is true, and the Isra, the vision that it, it, over the city of Jerusalem, there's a connection to Jerusalem. And then the, the persecution starts, also in the year 620, somewhere within that year. And there are a number of followers of Muhammad that flee, that flee the city of Mecca. Uh, they're going to take off to the city. They're going to actually go to, there is a store, a large contingent wind up going to Abyssinia, ancient Ethiopia. They're welcomed by the Christian king. Ethiopia is fleeing for persecution. They believe in one God, just as the king of Ethiopia does. Uh, Ethiopian king is a Christian. They have been a Christian kingdom since uh, the later part of the first century AD. They've been there for a while. They welcome Muhammad's followers. They offer protection. And so based on that uh, guardianship, uh, one of the tenets that comes out of early Islam is that the Muslims will never attack Ethiopia because uh, out of the, the fact that they sheltered uh, the pilgrims who came to escape persecution from Makkah. Uh, and so with that being said, something else develops, and that is there is an offer made that same year from the city of Medina. Of course, the word Medina means city. <laughs> Uh, it's going to be called Medina later, uh, Medina al Nabi, I think, Nabi, uh, which is, means that the, the city of the prophet. And so uh, the original name is Yathrib, Y A T H R I B, but Muhammad changed the name from Yathrib to uh, Medina al Nabi. So they make him an offer. This comes in 620. Uh, all, so a lot of things happen in 620. It's sort of the beginning of, of movement, uh, people taking sides, persecution starting, and then there's this rather, uh, oh, you have to say providential offer uh, to the prophet to come to the city of Medina and uh, become an, ar an arbitrator, a leader of the community, a judge in the community, a counselor in the community, uh, to settle their disputes. They they were good people, but they had a the big. It's a big city. They had a very large Jewish population, and they had a large population of Arabs that had converted to Judaism. But they had no end of quarrels, and so he's brought. He, he, the offer is made, and he, just, he he takes his time. He doesn't he doesn't just say, "Oh, sure, I'll do that." There is negotiation. The process that took place over a two-year period between 620 and 622 when he goes to Yathrib, Y-A-T-H-R-I-B, the old name, because you'll see it written both ways. Uh, and he's obviously made a deal that he is not gonna, he's not gonna go there and just be another schlub. He's not gonna just go there and be, give advice. He's gonna go there as a leader of the community. He's made this negotiation. They want him. Why? Because he has a reputation, and this is hugely important. He has a reputation for honesty, for fairness, for fair play, for mercy. But obviously, they recognize something about him that the people of Mecca do not, and that there's there's a quality to this individual. There's a spiritual quality to him. There is a almost a miraculous quality to him. They want him to come. I mean, out of nowhere, you have a caravan leader, a caravan driver who was chosen, I mean, out of all the people in the world, he's chosen to come and lead a community. So he moves from becoming just a merely a preacher <coughs> of, of Islam to becoming a practitioner of Islam. Put it to work. Make it work. And this happens. He makes the journey in the year 622. It's called The journey is called the Hijra, H-I-J-R-A, the Hijra. That is the year one in the Islamic calendar, the Hijra. Year one is the year 622. 
So that's when the calendar starts. So every time now, when you when you see a calendar, Muslim calendar, you see that when it says AH, they're using that system after Hitra. It's, instead of AD, it's AH. Now AD does not mean after the death. People always say it's, that's Latin. It's Latin. It's Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. So AH is after Hitra. It's an important start. What year is this now? 1434. 1434. 34. 34. 34. Yeah. Okay. Makes me feel young. <laughs> okay. I can take I can reduce my birthday by a lot using that calendar. <laughs> I suddenly felt so old the day after my birthday because it turned when I hit 76, I thought, gee, that's really old. I mean, that is really old. It's not, not a joke. And I used to think about that. I thought, oh, no, that's never going to happen again. It happens. <laughs> anyway, there's no, no one has spared this. Oh, my God, okay. So he goes to Medina. There are tremendous battles that take place in the city of Medina between opposing parties. His job is to settle the disputes, make judgments, set up a community of the faithful, uh, they're going to, it's going to be known as the Uma, U-M-M-A. Uma is community of the faithful. It's not based on tribal relationships, but it's based on those who are believers. There is a word for those who accept him, believe in him, and accept his, accept his, his the premise that he is a, the last of the prophets. <coughs> And as he works through the issues in the city of Medina, he has this very large Jewish population. Now that population probably came there. This is somewhere after AD 70, number one, and again after AD 120. What went on in those years? The destruction twice. The city of Jerusalem is destroyed by the Romans, both in 70 AD and in one, one in 120 AD. That is a direct correlation to the Jewish diaspora, the spreading of the Jews throughout the Mediterranean, having to flee the Romans. The Romans destroyed the city, they destroyed the temple. The temple was just totally dismantled. The only thing that's left <coughs> of the temple, the way that obviously the temple that Muhammad saw when at the Ezra, was the temple that was fully intact. That was the temple that had been built by Herod, King Herod. Uh, and all that was left of that after AD 70 were just the, the basic foundation of that temple. The rest of it was knocked to, knocked to shreds. Today, that right there is the, is the Wailing Wall. That is the foundation of the Temple of Herod. Above it is the Great Mosque. Why is the mosque there? Because this is where Muhammad came down. So all these things, this, this interconnected tissue, uh, also in the same city next door to that, you have the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is which built by uh, the mother of, <coughs> started by Constantine and, and then finished by the uh, money given by Emperor Justinian through his mother. Um, it's a strange church. It just, it's all over the place. It contains uh, oh, well over 100 rooms to it. It has a location where uh, the, garden of, the garden of Jesus prayed was the, is in there. Uh, where he was betrayed by Judas, you have in there the, where the crucifixion took place. You've got the, the hill of Calvary, Golgotha, there. And you've got the tomb where he was buried and the location where the resurrection took place. And it's all in this church. I never saw any, I never believed in my life that I, because I, when I went there, I just could never conceive of a church that would have all those things, claiming to have all those things inside this church. I always call it Christian Disneyland. <laughs> and every month of every faith, and every order, every you know, uh, Orthodox Christians, Roman Catholic Christians, uh, Cistercian monks, uh, Franciscan monks, Dominican monks, are all of them have. Coptic monks from Egypt, Armenian Orthodox monks, are all in throughout this 
this church sitting in these sacred locations with their hat out, looking for bombs, looking for looking for money. You go into the tomb, the empty tomb where Jesus is supposed to have come to life in that tomb, and there's a monk sitting on top of the empty tomb with his hat on. I mean, I I felt like saying, what, are you the one that did it? You know, you're here, you're collecting money like you did it, you know? But that's that's Jerusalem. And you see all the Jews at the bottom of the wall, praying, the wailing wall, putting their little prayers inside the wall. And above, you hear the call to prayer at the Blue Mosque, the Al-Aqsa. It's up there, the call to prayer is there. It's all going on. It is incredible. They say people who go to Jerusalem sometime today get, get hit with a uh, kind of a uh, holy sickness. Seriously. Uh, even people who don't believe in anything, they go there and they, and they see all this and they just get, they, they feel like they walk back into the Old Testament or something. And you kind of feel that way, except for the armed Israeli guards that are all over the place with their AK-47s and Uzis. You know, oh, gee. You're not sure how to play it. Okay. Uh, when I was there, they had the first intifada you mean that there was the strike against Israel because of the occupation of parts of Jerusalem and parts of the West Bank and the resistance against it and all that stuff. So you had old double guards and then you had all the shops closed, all the shopkeepers closed, everything. But then you walk by and you're, I was there as part of a group that came from the United States education deal. And as soon as we walked by, they opened up the shutter. Come, come. <laughs> I have a rug for you. <laughs> You want to buy a nice trophy? You want to buy this? You want to buy this? So I mean, I love it. I love, I love it. You gotta love it. It's just unlike anything in the West. Okay. Okay. Um, so you know, you really need. To, I mean, I, I hope sometime in your lifetime that going to the Middle East will be a very feasible thing. You got to pick where you want to go, but remember, you're gonna be you're gonna be off to a royal treat no matter what you do. It is just phenomenal. It's just phenomenal. Never, ever to be forgotten. Okay, so uh, he's now teaching at Medina. He's accepted as, as a leader. He's accepted as the last of the prophets by most, not everyone. Now, to see the, the, the humanness of the prophet Muhammad, you can already see it here, he is struggling with something. He knows the revelations that he has received are real. They're real to him. I mean, that, folks, it doesn't matter to me what you believe about this. But you have to understand to him and to his followers, what he is going through is real. He believes it. He sees it. He measures it. He writes it. Before he's done, he's going to write <coughs> 140 chapters of it. 140 surahs. That spell out the Holy Quran. He's going to talk about it all the time. Traditions around him talk about it, the Hadith, written by many, many observers at the time, extra material about what's going on here. A lot of confirmation. And there's a struggle going on as he is in the city of Medina. We'll simply call it Yathri for a while. He's there and he knows the, the relationship between what he has been receiving from the angel, angel Gabriel, the relationship between that and Judaism. He sees the connection. His cousin, actually his, his wife's relative, saw that connection and said, you're receiving this just like Moses received the Ten Commandments. So he sees that connection, and he's trying to make a connection with the Jewish community at Yathrib. The first holiday he <coughs> proclaims that they're going to celebrate is the holiday of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, very sacred in the Jew one of the most sacred days in the Jewish calendar. It's where you go into the Holy of Holies in the temple, you offer a sacrifice, the priest goes in, and what is there at that center of focus of the temple is the Ark of the Covenant, the great Ark of the Covenant, sacred, sacred heart of, of Judaism. 
So Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, the day when all your sins are forgiven, becomes a, a holy, high holy day in the early Islamic calendar. Also, you will pray facing the city of Jerusalem. I mean, you read these things, you go, wait a minute, what's going on here? What he is doing, he is, he is making himself available to the Jewish community and says, I, I think I am the fulfillment of what you're looking for. Some accept it, some don't. So what you go through here is, I mean, it's difficult to understand unless you work with <coughs> some, some of your own theological issues in your own life. But he's beginning to see something as the Jews begin to reject him, which they do, in the city of Medina, Yathrib. He begins to second guess this, and he says, maybe I'm wrong to have Yom Kippur as a major holiday. Maybe I'm wrong in having a prayer toward Jerusalem. Maybe somewhere along, I mean, there is a struggle going on here. And then he turns his attention, it, it, it dawns on him that there is the God that he grew up with, the God that he knows about in the city, in the center of the city of Makkah. And that's the God, Allah, the God of the Kaaba, who has shared that Kaaba with statues and idols, but it's also had other gods in there that were prominent, like Buzza and Alat, prominent in that, in that, but he's looking, he says, you know, I mean, I don't know how to put this exactly, but he says to him, to say it this way, Allah of the Kaaba, and the word Allah simply means the God. Allah of the Kaaba is God. The only God. The universal God. It takes him a while, I, I think it takes him a while to, to figure this out. He's searching. He's, he's receiving revelations, but he's also searching. What does it mean? How do I put it together? That's a tough thing. Very tough thing. I mean, Jesus went through some of the same thing. He talked about, you know, I and my Father are one. But he also called himself the Son of Man. Some said he's the Son of God. He says, no, I'm not that. I'm not this. Don't use that. But there's, 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 you have the psychological, the human part of, of somebody who's receiving <coughs> revelation, trying to figure out what it means and how to interpret it to the world. I mean, that's a, I mean, that's a tough proposition. On any level, it's a, it's a tough one. So he makes this decision that they should pray facing Makkah. No longer Jerusalem, but Makkah. And that Allah is the God, the God. And he's at the Kaaba, he's been there all the time. But that he needs to worship alone. Because this God is one God. A revelation comes to him. It's one, he's one God. And he's, he's one in substance. He's one in person. He's one in essence. There is no division of this deity into, into parts. He's a single unified God. It's not like Christianity. Now Christianity, remember the, the term Trinity, I want you to understand it, is an artificial term. It's never used anywhere in the New Testament, ever. Ever. But the way Jesus talks, he is definitely talking about, in his view, a triune God. There is a <coughs> God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We know they are separate, in the Christian tradition, they are separate persons. One God, but separate persons. Expressed in three persons. We know in ancient Israel, the first mention of God in ancient Israel, uh, the God, the creator God, Elohim. Elohim, there is a, there's a word for God in, in Hebrew. It's the old Semitic word, word is El, just El, singular. What is Elohim? It's plural. It's plural. 
And it says, let us make man in our image. What, are you, what is this? Wait a minute. Stop the music. You ever looked at these things, seriously looked at them, you'll know that there are some strange things out there that we don't understand. And so you have a plurality here. In, and yet the Jews say well, they only believe in one God, but, you, but, it's, but the God is always written down as a plural. It's the oldest name for God. In Hebrew, the, pro, the name for Lord in Hebrew is Yahweh, which is the unpronounceable, can't pronounce it. But Elohim is the word for God, and it's always plural. Always. Ask Jewish scholars about it. Why is it plural? I don't know. <laughs> Ask my rabbi. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and I don't think they think about it very much. But here, Allah is 100% singular, solo, one God, one in essence, one in substance, one in person. Unchanging. So this is what we would call a strict, very <coughs> strict monotheism. Very strict. It doesn't get any stricter, okay? And most began to accept this. And based on that, he, he now establishes the community, the Uma, of the faithful, who their loyalties and faithfulness to him and what he's teaching, and the brotherhood that's shared between them as they all begin to accept and believe his judgments and his works and so forth, these are all things which tie them together. It's a greater unity than tribal unity. It's a greater unity than family unity. It's a greater unity that, that all the human unity put together is this unity based on the faith. It surpasses everything. Or you might say, it, it, in the tribal sense, it will even enhance it. So you have a reality, you have a, a connective tissue between fellow Muslims that you don't have ordinarily even among your family, your relatives, your friends, you don't have that. This surpasses everything. So that is called the community of the faithful. That's the Ummah. Those who don't believe this, those who reject him, there's a word for it. They are called the Munafukim. I have to really say that properly. It means hypocrite. But you're lucky, I brought my glasses to me. Muna Fikun. I know I had something backwards, yes. It's, it's correct in both ways. It's correct both ways? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, means hypocrite. I'll spell it again M U N A F I Q U N. Those are the non followers. No. Those who are the helpers who help bring it about, who work to create the community, are called, it's, the word is ansar, A-N-S-A-R with a dot below the S. It's a kind of a, it's a sound. Got it. Ansar, helpers. So you want to be a helper, you don't want to be a munafakim, okay? You don't want to do this. Uh, that really has a nasty ring to it. Sounds bad. It sounds bad. Okay. It's like you talk about those words that sound bad. They are bad. Yeah, it has a, it has a ring to it. Okay. Um, so, Allah, God of the Kaaba, now is God. That's that is a that that is what you might call both revelation and evolution. Revelation that dawns on him, but it's a process of evolution from one, from looking at the, the Jewish tradition that he was trying to emulate, try to bring the Jews in to follow him, and then he switches when he realizes he's barking up the wrong tree. Now you say, how can a prophet bark up the wrong tree? Well, it's just a bad expression to use here. But the thing is, there's this 
but something is going on and there's changes taking place and he makes this move. And then once this is established, uh, he knows that praying to Mecca, what, what's going, what's, what comes next? Mecca is going to have to be controlled. Mecca is going to have to be taken. Mecca is going to have to be conquered. Uh, the Quraysh control Mecca. They are making a lot of money off the worship of the many gods at the Kaaba. This is a big <coughs> economic and political issue. I'm not sure how much it had to do with their religion, but it certainly had to do with their, their money making. Um, and Muhammad is a threat to this. But also Muhammad, the Prophet Muhammad now knows that he needs to take the city of that has, has the Kaaba. If I'm teaching this, we need to be there. This is the heart and soul of Islam. We need to be there. This is the capital. It's where it should be. This should be the political as well as the religious center. And so for the next uh, eight years, makes a plan to, in fact, take the city of, of Makkah. Uh, this is not going to be easy. Makkans are well armed. They have a, traditionally a good sized army, several thousand. Uh, they have financed, financed this. They are prepared to fight. Uh, Muhammad has a, Prophet Muhammad has a very small military force. And over the next eight years, they're going to have collisions uh, over the caravan trade. Uh, and it's going to lead to war. And in almost every time, every battle, uh, the Prophet Muhammad and his forces are way outnumbered, and almost every time they fight takes place, he wins. Now nobody's making this up. This is this is this is the real thing. This is so you have to look at this and say, is this are they just better generals? They're just lucky with fewer weapons, fewer people. <coughs> they're winning. How does that happen? <coughs> or is this divine intervention? You have to you have to really examine in other words in order to measure the strength, the growing strength of Islam in Medina, under the leadership of the Prophet Muhammad, you have to look at things that are going on here. The Quran itself being a great miracle, but the other thing is winning battles, militarily ba battles that you probably shouldn't win. And you keep winning them. How does this happen? Is it miraculous? And I think anybody that's part of the faithful are going to look back at this and say, yes, this had to be a period of miracles. Miraculous. This is miraculous. I mean, look at this. We should never have won. But we did win. And then he takes the city of Makkah in the year 630. Takes the city. He's back in his own city. And everybody expects, oh boy, we've had it. We're going to die. This is a this is an old tradition. This is a, you take the city and you kill the enemy. You loot the city, you devastate the city, kill your enemies. Common. He doesn't do it. He spares them, which absolutely knocked him over. I mean, it, <coughs> you're going to let us live. What he did do was go into the Kaaba and destroy the idols. Knock down all the this is this is what we're gonna this is what we're gonna destroy. There is only one God, Allah. This is his sacred home, this is his place. We clean out everything else. There's no revenge. There's no exacting uh, executions on anybody. This is so out of the ordinary. It, it is a process that be, begins a process of what I would call uh, you win, but you can, you can show mercy. And this is a long-term Muslim tradition, showing mercy. This is why I think a lot of the people that, that are fighting today and killing each other in, in the Middle East, they're not practicing Islam. They're not showing mercy. We did the same thing. I was talking to my class yesterday in the West during the period of the Protestant Reformation in Christianity. We killed everybody in sight for 150 years. 
each other. Protestants, Lutherans versus Catholics versus Calvinists versus Baptists. And I don't know how many people were killed. I'm probably close to a third of the population of Europe. So it happens. <coughs> Keep in mind that there's nothing new under the sun. Okay. But this change of heart, showing of mercy, is you're going to have a phenomenal event take place again uh, in the uh, 12th, about the 12th century, uh, with the coming of the Crusaders and the, their defeat by who? Salah Adin, the Kurd. <laughs> but Salah Adin spares Richard the Lionheart and his forces, allows him to leave Jerusalem, get out. Go on board your little boat and get out of here. Just go do it. Christians weren't doing that. They were killing everybody in sight. They killed other Christians because they were the wrong kind of Christian. They definitely killed Muslims and they killed Jews. They killed everybody. They were equal opportunity maniacs. Okay? The Crusaders. Most Americans think, oh, well, we didn't do the Crusades. Well, yeah, you did. Your ancestors did. Okay. Okay. So, uh, takes the city of Medina, takes now has the city of Mecca, it's under his control, and it is a city where you're going to have the, the again, the it's, the, it's the final show, the final location, the final direct, it's like the answer, the answer to everything, the answer to prayer, we've taken the city of Mecca. Kaaba is now established as the center of the worship of Allah. And just as suddenly as it all began in the year 632, the Prophet Muhammad died. Burial was quick. Yes? 632. So how old was he? He was born in 570. He's 62 years old. Today we'd say that's a pretty young man. Died very young, really. Died very young. But what comes after is a this incredible geopolitical change that takes this part of the world and transforms it into something that did not exist at all just a few decades earlier. Not not even a clue. It is a it is a geopolitical and religious phenomenon that sweeps over the Middle East, North Africa, all the way to Western India, eventually south to Indonesia, all the way to the Philippines and the <coughs> Malaysian Peninsula, and all the way across the North Africa, the Sahara, to Southern Spain. It's just absolute phenomenon. And the spread of the Arabic language goes with it. Not everybody speaks Arabic language, but everybody has Arabic language. Of parts of it transmitted into their into their culture. Why? Because the reading of the Quran every Friday is a reading that is done into sacred Arabic. Arabic is going to become part of these languages. All of them. All of them. It's going to spread as far north as the Caucasus Mountains. As far East as the Great Wall of China, as far west as southern France at the Battle of Tours, T-O-U-R-S, all within less than a century of the death of the Prophet Muhammad. Conversion will take place by much of the population but something that has to be made clear, the conversion that takes place of much of this population from Coptic Orthodoxy, Byzantine Orthodoxy, or Persian Zoroastrianism, or Southern Spanish Catholicism, all of this that takes place is not done, as most people think, by the rubric convert or die which, which is always said, always said. Convert or die. Convert, you have the Quran in one hand and the sword in the other. You're going to convert or you're going to die. You know, what do you want to do? I'll convert, man. You know, you know. Didn't happen that way. 
there, there were instances when that, that certainly could have happened, but especially in, during the military clashes, but more than that. Uh, the populations converted on their own because what happens is you have a <coughs> population that becomes a subject population to the Muslim warriors who conquer these areas. And we'll talk about that on, on uh, Tuesday. But you'll have the subject population who are going to who are going to keep their religion. They're going to keep their own ideas for a long, long period of time. But at the same time, it's not in the interest of the Muslim conquerors to convert these, this population because this population will pay the special tax. In other words, why are you killing? your cash cow by making them convert or die. Because what, what they want, they're going to get the money from taxation. It's against their better judgment to, to try and kill somebody rather than attack. You just simply you pay a higher tax as a non-Muslim. That's it. But you think, well, that's really unfair. Well, no, not really, because the tax they're going to pay is a lot lower than the tax they were paying to the Byzantines or the Persians. We'll talk about that. How long does it take for Islam to win the heart and soul of the majority population of, let's say, of the Middle East by itself? If it starts here in the late 6th and early 7th century, and you have the conquest pretty much finished by 650 AD, how long is it going to take for the population to convert? We have records, for instance, in the most populous area of that region, that's Egypt, where the population, the majority population, were still Coptic Christians until the 12th century. <coughs> so obviously, convert or die was not the rubric by which you spread your faith. <coughs> Conversion took place on its own. There are certain rules about conversion, which we'll talk about also on Tuesday. Because once you convert to Islam, you don't reconvert to something else. You don't do it. It's not recognized. And we'll talk about why that's, that's the case. We'll talk about the first instances of that, of that happening. 